Hello and welcome to this episode of Felonious, a podcast where we discuss the realm of true crime. From chilling cold cases to the wild and wacky, we'll explore it all with a perfect blend of seriousness and humour. My name is Emma and I'm Nazia. To keep up to date with what's coming up, be sure to follow us on Instagram at felonious.pod and visit our website feloniouspod.com. We hope you enjoy this episode, so let's get to it. Cool. Cool, yo. What's been happening? It's still summer in France. It's winter here. (laughs) It was nine degrees today. You're closer to the weather than it should be. It was almost 28 degrees yesterday. And I had ice cream on Sunday. Which doesn't feel right in October. No, not at all. No. It's Halloween month. It's spooky season. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although when this episode's being released, it's gonna not quite going to be yeah. spooky season. No. But hopefully the weather will have somehow adjusted and we have actual autumn, winter weather. Yeah. We're so British, aren't we? Talking about the weather all the time. I know. It's just the way we know how to start a conversation, (laughs) isn't it? (laughs) But, yeah. What's been happening at your end? What have you found this week? I found two things. And um, I completely forgot what they were until, like, (laughs) before we joined in on this call. Right. But they're two very different articles. Depends if you want to start with baked beans first or a dog. Uh, let's start with baked beans. Okay. So this is a, a Daily Mail article. Sorry, folks. Daily fail. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> this is in 2021. Mystery vandal menaces village by pouring baked beans through letterboxes and overcars. Police are searching for a mystery vandal targeting houses and cars in Surrey. The baked bean bandit is pouring the popular breakfast snack into letterboxes. I wouldn't say it as a popular breakfast snack. I would say it as a popular food item. Yeah, because it can be breakfast, lunch and And dinner. And dinner. And supper. Yeah. It's very versatile. It's not just for breakfast, guys. No. Where in Surrey did this happen? Residents in Wanush say the felon is attacking their property overnight. Never heard of that place. I have never heard of this place either. Uh, I'm not sure it exists. It sounds like one of those that has been made up, but this wasn't published in April, so it's not an April Fool's. And there's picture evidence of baked beans all over a silver car. It's got baked beans on the roof and they're running down the window. Now police are urging anyone with information to spill the beans. Ha ha ha. Good one, police. What a waste. Why would you want to waste baked beans like that? We're in, we're in a cost of... I mean, people are struggling to put food on the table. Yeah. And some twat in Surrey... I mean, Surrey's full of lots of twats, to be fair. Well, if we have Surrey listeners... Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Not everyone from Surrey is a twat, but a lot of people are. Just saying. Well, you've got one twat that's pouring baked beans all over people's property. Yeah. And it's not even like a supermarket brand. It's the actual proper one. Yeah, it's Heinz. Heinz. It's not the cheap stuff. No, because beans means Heinz. So. Yeah. Beans, beans are good for your heart. Beans, beans, they make you fart. Isn't it like the more you eat, the more you fart? Oh, yeah, that's it. (laughs) I've been singing it wrong. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to, to my to my French partner. I thought you were going to say to your kid. <laughs> no, but I will do. I'll start singing it to her when she's old enough to eat baked beans. She probably is old enough, but when she's old enough to understand what she's eating. The victims were understandably distressed by this unacceptable behaviour. It's got to be a nuisance to clean, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah... It'd be easy on a car, but I reckon if it got inside and like... on your carpet and stuff, it might smell yeah. a bit and be difficult to get out. Yeah. <laughs> Someone was worried about the house prices going down because of this horrendous criminal act. Um, <laughs> don't think a can of baked beans is going <laughs> to 
cause any drastic uh, hindrance to their house sales. Apparently one resident said, what half-baked idiots would do this? I hope they get thrown in the can. Absolutely hinds us crime. Ha ha ha. <laughs> oh God. Maybe that's why they wanted to do it. They just wanted to get a whole load of dad jokes and puns in the newspaper. Yeah, the residents did it themselves. Yeah. <laughs> they were bored and they wanted to have some bad jokes published. <laughs> What's the second one? So, motorist find after dog seen behind wheel of car. Oh, I heard about this. So, this was about three days ago. This was published. This is on uh, the BBC News website. And police in Slovakia find a car owner whose dog was behind the wheel because a speed camera took a photo of this vehicle and it was posted on Facebook and it appears to show a smiling dog in the driving seat of a Skoda. The, the car owner insisted that his pet had suddenly leapt into his lap while he was driving. But the officers who saw the footage said that um, that wasn't the case and because there was no sudden movement in the car. But was the, was the dog driving dangerously and over the speed limit? Well, the, it's not really clear if the fine was to do with the speeding or for failing to secure himself, the dog, in a moving car. Yeah. Anyway, the, the moral of the story is please make sure your pets are secure and that they can't easily get into the driver's seat. Yeah, it's got to be quite a nuisance having a dog in the driver's seat and on your lap if you are driving. Yeah, but I've seen a lot of people do it with like little dogs. You know, those like yeah, chihuahua uh, kind of things yeah um alex actually asked that the other day we were driving somewhere i can't remember where and there was a dog in the front of the car and i was like who does that <laughs> i was like a dog owner with a small dog yeah my dog when i was little he, his name was george he was dashend yeah and my mum used to have him on her lap when she was in the passenger seat when my dad was driving yeah because he used to get car sick in the back so he couldn't travel in the back Oh, that is so cute. Yeah. He used to put his front legs on, on the dashboard and just stare out the front window. That is so cute. <laughs> See, if I had a dog, I wouldn't mind him sitting on my lap in the front. Maybe not for long journeys, because that would just get a bit much. Yeah, they do press on your bladder a little bit. Yeah, I remember when we um, brought the cats home. It was like a two hour drive and I had the cat box on my lap the whole time and I was pregnant as well. So I had really bad morning sickness. Oh dear. And the smell of the cats made it so much worse. So I had to like vomit in a bag. Oh no. With, with the cat box <laughs> on my lap <laughs> while Alex was driving home. It was so gross. Oh, that sounds so dramatic. But, yeah, yeah. These two cats, like, not having it. Well, Speculus was like a two-month-old kitten back then. But yeah, that was a journey. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Those were my finds for this week. They were good finds. That dog one especially. I, I saw that on Instagram and that was I was laughing. I wanted to send it to you, but then you've obviously found it already. Yeah, straight in there. You know me and dogs. Yeah. So what are we talking about today? Not dogs and not baked beans, unfortunately. No, we're a bit on serious business today, but not too serious. Yeah, it's not like morbid. No, it's not as heavy as last week's episode. Oh God, no. Um, so in this episode, we'll be discussing the Bangladesh bank heist that happened in 2016. And it's one of the biggest cyber heists in the world. But I had never heard anything hardly at all about it before researching this case. No, me neither. So it's quite an interesting one. We'll explore how the hackers planned their attack, what they did with the stolen cash, and why the Philippines and the US were involved. But when are the US not involved in anything? Yep, I know, right? We'll also discover who the Lazarus group are 
and how they need to make improvements on their spelling and star sign telling. All will become clear, listeners. But first, a little disclaimer. Yeah, I mean, as, as we mentioned, nothing grim. There's, it's mainly going to be talking about a lot of money. Yeah. Like, is it incomprehensible or unco- incomprehensible? You wouldn't think I'd, I had done an English degree how many years ago. Um, <laughs> but a lot of money that you just cannot comprehend. Large amounts of money. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to fit it in a shoebox. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Not that I do that. I don't do that. Please, no shoeboxes <laughs> no, in this I don't, house. Don't think I'm, I do know someone who has done that. Very stupid. There's also going to be mentions of Hitler. In this yeah, episode. just briefly. Just, yeah, yeah, just one mention, but it's there anyway. And cybercrime, obviously. Yep. Uh, we'll probably be, do a bit of swearing, but not much because it's not. It, it's not a very. It's not an anger-provoking case as such. It's just quite baffling. I found it quite baffling. Well, we probably will swear when we get all the technology and computer terms wrong. Yes, or if my cat decides to jump on the laptop again. Yeah, or if my dog Luna decides to make more of an appearance than what she already has. So I, I'm dog sitting tonight, so uh, <laughs> she'll probably lend a, a hand at some point. Yeah, no, she's a good dog. Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the research, so, uh, research sources, I can finally say that. Uh, <laughs> And mostly come from the documentaries Billion Dollar Heist and Hacked, the Bangladesh Bank Heist. The Billion Dollar Heist is a, a recent film documentary, which I found quite informative. But the Hacked, the Bangladesh Bank Heist, uh, one episode documentary actually goes into a lot of detail that the film doesn't touch upon, I find. Yeah, I found that as well. But they did kind they both had interviewed one guy. Like he was featured in both of them, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, the the second one was definitely a bit more informative. Yeah. Especially around some of the legislation that prevented investigators from we'll go into it. I won't spoil it now. <laughs> yeah. But they they're both really informative, so we really recommend yeah. those. And then it was just basically news articles to back up what those programs talked about. So we'll start with like a brief history of cybercrime, I guess. Yeah, this was quite a learning curve for us. Yeah, there's there's loads I didn't know about. And yeah. I, I was around at this time. I was like a, a teenager when most of this stuff happened. We We were using the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Although I do remember some some of these viruses that we'll talk about. Yeah. But yeah, I'll we'll get started. Yeah. So prior to 2000, hackers were mainly focusing on disrupting the functions of well-known websites. And the enemy then were teenagers who were simply making malware, viruses and other cyber attacks for fun, for shits and giggles. Viruses and malware were transferred between networks via floppy disks. Those are those square things... Do you remember that had like a metal circle thing on the back? I still have some floppy disks. Blimey. Yeah. And they had that metal <laughs> slidey thing that was quite, you know, yeah. before fidget toys came about. It was quite satisfying <laughs> to play with. Anyway, this process was slow and not an instant hit. People would physically have to travel in order to spread the virus or malware. And then the internet appeared, which meant that these attacks could happen in seconds. Hackers started to realise that they could use their skills to make money and this took up speed in Eastern Europe, in Russia and Cisblock countries such as Armenia, Belarus, Moldova, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Ukraine. Viruses were being written to infect Windows computers which were then sold to email spammers who would then use those computers to send spam to individuals in order to make money. This was at a time when online banking had just started, so the hackers started to steal online banking logins, credit card numbers, and would transfer the funds to other accounts. But going after the individuals who held those accounts was a lot harder and took a lot longer 
to get a good sum of money. So they then realised that attacking the banks themselves was a lot easier and the rewards were a lot greater. They would hack into bank databases where credit card numbers were stored and then sell that information on the black market. So we moved from an internet system that served a couple of hundred thousand to one which supports global finance and business. Economic opportunity was on the internet and it wasn't constricted by norms, national boundaries and only limited by the creativity of the hackers themselves. And a few notable cases, well, one being in 1971, it was the first example of a computer virus, a program called Creeper, designed by Bob Thomas. It was designed to travel around computer systems on the internet's predecessor, ARPANET, and it displayed the message, I'm the Creeper, catch me if you can. And interestingly, the guy who invented email, Ray Tomlinson, he created a program called Reaper, which tracked and terminated the Creeper virus. And this could be described as the first antivirus software. I found that quite interesting. Yeah. In 1986, the first person charged under the US Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, who was a student called Robert Morris, and he created a worm which nearly brought down the early internet. And in 2000, the I Love You or Love Bug, which was the first internet worm to go around the world in less than 48 hours. The interruption cost businesses nearly a billion dollars. The virus infected the recipient's machine, and then it emailed everyone that the recipient had ever emailed, which impacted the mail servers. And the only way to solve it was to shut them down which caused the interruption in business. The virus was written by Anel de Guzman, who was a 24-year-old student, and it was the first sign to show that we relied heavily on the internet, but we do so even more today. De Guzman also did this because he couldn't afford to pay for his own internet connection in the Philippines, so he was stealing usernames and passwords to gain internet access. He wasn't charged for what he did because there, was no, there were no cybercrime laws back then. So it wasn't considered illegal at the time. Yeah, sorry, how could you go from just wanting to have free internet connection to bringing down businesses? Yeah, I, I think he, he didn't expect it to go as far as it did. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of sources have said that he was out to get notoriety, but... Yeah. I don't think that was the case because he didn't expect it to go that far, so. Right. But anyway. In 2010, there was a, a computer worm called Stuxnet that targeted the centrifuge in Iran's uranium enrichment facility. And we'll discuss this later uh, in the episode. In 2017, there was WannaCry, which is one of the biggest ransomware offences in history. It infected 230,000 computers in 150 countries. And we'll also talk about this later on in the episode. So cybercrime at the time of the Bangladesh bank heist in 2016 had been investigated for only almost 20 years and nothing of this scale had ever been done before. It's usually transfers of a few hundred thousand dollars to a couple of million, not a billion. Yeah. So a bit of history about the bank. The Bangladesh Bank is in Dhaka, which is one of the world's poorest cities. 22 million people live here and a third are surviving on less than $2 a day. The bank is the central bank of Bangladesh and is owned by the government. And like many other national banks, the bank holds an account with the Federal Reserve Bank in New York to deposit, maintain and transfer the country's foreign currency reserve. I said a bit of history about the bank, that's the only bit of information (laughs) I have. That's all we need to know at this point. (laughs) So what exactly happened at the Bangladesh Bank? On Thursday the 4th of February 2016, staff had gone home for the weekend, which is Friday to Saturday in Bangladesh, and all was quiet inside the bank. 
but something was lurking in computer networks, undetected by staff. Hackers had gotten into the SWIFT terminal at the bank and logged 35 requests to transfer $951 million from the Bangladesh Bank's account at the New York Federal Reserve in the US. SWIFT stands for the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. I can understand why they shorten it to SWIFT. Yeah. It's the messaging system that banks use and other financial institutions use to send messages and requests for money transfers. In 1973, banks were sending messages to each other using a system called Telex, which was like a fax system. It wasn't very secure and it wasn't automated. So 239 banks from 15 countries said, let's use computers. And so SWIFT was formed. Thousands of banks and 200 countries use the SWIFT network where trillions of dollars flows through it per day. But the hack in the Bangladesh Bank didn't start on the 4th of February 2016. It actually started a whole year before. So in order to get into the bank's computer network, the hackers had to study the staff at the bank by looking at their social media profiles to find the right friend or target. They used that friend or target to send an email to ensnare the person whose social media profiles they had studied. The hackers found three dozen employees and they generated a spear phishing email which contained a CV or resume from a guy called Rasal Alam, who was looking for job prospects at the bank. The attachment in the email was a zip folder, which actually contained a CV, but it also contained malicious data. Out of the 36 people who were sent the email, three of them clicked on the attachment. This then sent a message to the hackers to notify them that the three staff members' computers were compromised and gave them full control. The malware contained in the attachment started to take screenshots of data on the computers as well as copying keystrokes in order to get login information and it was doing all of this undetected. The hackers then mapped every single bit of computer network where a number of computers were connected to each other using a switch so they could talk to each other and keep each other company. Now, in a bank that has good security, The system would be segmented where only a certain number of computers are connected to one switch. However, the switches in use at the Bangladesh Bank were cheap ones and were not segmented so all of the computers could communicate with each other. The hackers were rubbing their hands at this point and used this to their advantage by searching other machines on the network to infect and find other credentials or login information. They then used those credentials until they were able to log into the SWIFT terminal. This would have taken months to do, and they managed to do it on the 29th of January 2016. The hackers then had five days to ready their software and cover their tracks. The reason why the hackers waited until the 4th of February is because holidays and weekends were being observed in different parts of the world. It was a weekend in Bangladesh, The weekend was about to start in New York and it was a bank holiday in the Philippines and we'll explain why this is important later on. So the staff in the bank in Bangladesh had gone home for the weekend. The hackers then took control of the SWIFT terminal and made $951 million transaction requests to the New York Federal Reserve. As New York is 10 hours behind Bangladesh, The Fed saw these 35 requests for almost the entire amount of US dollars that the Bangladeshi bank held. The operator at the Fed cancelled the requests, not because of the nearly $1 billion they totaled, but because they were incorrectly formatted. So all the research the hackers had done didn't cover the module on form filling. Nope. The Fed replied to the Bangladesh bank via the SWIFT system, which the hackers had control of and said that they had forgotten to put an intermediate bank on the form for 34 out of the 35 requests. So the hackers fixed their mistake and sent the request again. An intermediate bank acts as a a middleman between the bank sending the money 
and the bank receiving the money in an international wire transfer. It's all very complex. Yes. The request which did have an intermediate bank was Deutsche Bank for $20 million to a charity called the Shalika Foundation in Sri Lanka. But there was a spelling mistake. The hackers had typed foundation instead of foundation, which Deutsche Bank thought was suspicious and so held the request. However, the other 34 that were corrected and sent back to the Fed got approved, but only four went through, totaling $81 million, and that went to the RCBC Bank in the Philippines, where the group had opened accounts six months earlier. So before the hackers got into the SWIFT terminal, in May 2015, four bank accounts had been opened at the RCBC Bank in Manila in the Philippines. According to the Hacked Bangladesh Bank documentary, the hackers recruited a Chinese man called Kim Wong, who was a Manila casino owner. He went to the RCBC Bank and presented four fake ID documents for four individuals to the bank manager, Maya Deguto? Yeah. Convinced Kim Wong was presenting legitimate documents, Maya Dekito opened the accounts and $500 was deposited in each of them. And then they lay dormant until the heist was carried out. Going back to the 4th of February in 2016, the 30 transactions that were waiting to be approved were stopped by the Fed because the address for the intermediate bank, RCBC Bank in the Philippines, was on Jupiter Street. Two years earlier, in 2014, a Greek shipping magnate, Dimitri Kambi, bought eight tankers. The money for these oil tankers came from Iran, which was under US sanctions. The US learnt that the Iranians were financing Dimitri Kambi. His company was called Jupiter Seaways, and therefore it was put on the US sanctions watch list. So, because of the word Jupiter, when Jupiter address, street address was caught by the computer system at the Fed, as the word Jupiter was on the watch list, they held the transactions, which nearly totaled $1 billion, and asked Bangladesh Bank for confirmation. However, the hackers had already logged out an hour before, so they couldn't reply to the Fed via SWIFT. If they had stayed for just one more hour, they probably would have ended up with the whole amount. It's like a hand smack in the head moment. Yeah. <laughs> However, they did end up stealing $81 million, which is no small feat. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that amount of money, to be fair. I don't know what I'd do with that amount of money. <laughs> I'd buy the bank. So... Yeah. <laughs> give Bangladesh Bank updated security systems <laughs> so on Friday the 5th of February which in Bangladesh is the weekend because it's the prayer day as it's a Muslim country but at the bank there were skeletal staff who were covering and they turned up for work among them was the duty manager Zubair bin Huda and he was part of an elite team who ran the swift banking system Zubair checked the SWIFT printer to check the transactions from the day before. There was also a ledger printed out every single day of every transaction that had occurred overnight. He found no SWIFT messages had been printed at all and that the printer had shut down. The duty manager tried to turn it on but nothing happened. He put it down to a technical error and he decided to go home for the night. He then came back the next morning, Saturday, to check it again. He managed to get the printer to work manually and it started to print loads of transactions, including requests to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York for the amount of nearly $1 billion, to which he must have thought, holy shit, and pooped his pants. <laughs> Do you imagine finding that request of nearly $1 million? You must have been like, what the fuck? And I don't want to have to deal with this on the weekend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he pulled a short straw coming in that day. Definitely did. So, $81 million had been removed from the Bangladesh Bank in a series of four transactions. The staff at the bank, understandably, began to panic once they realised the money had gone and it wasn't just a malfunctioning printer. The money went to a bank in the Philippines. As well as the stolen $81 million, 
the bank realised nearly 900 million extra had been requested. The bank staff had no idea what to do. They made desperate calls to the New York Fed, but it was a Saturday and their calls were being forwarded to an answering machine. The Federal Reserve Bank in New York depended on the SWIFT banking system, which up until this point was incredibly secure. However, they didn't have a 24-7 hotline, which is a bit crazy. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a bit weird. Yeah. So the staff at the Bangladesh Bank were able to talk to somebody at SWIFT who instructed the bank staff to shut everything down until they knew what was going on. Bodril Khan, a Bangladesh bank employee, phoned the deputy governor of the bank to get the go-ahead to shut everything down. But the deputy governor didn't want to take on that decision, so he called the governor, who said, Don't worry, it's probably a mistake. Don't bother shutting it down. So then, on Sunday, the 7th of February, at the start of the working week in Bangladesh, the general manager of the bank returned and realised what had happened. Meanwhile, the New York Fed was still closed as it was still the weekend, and the Bangladesh Bank discovered through the SWIFT printouts that most of the money had gone to a bank in Manila. So the bank staff sent messages to say stop the transactions immediately and don't let the money be withdrawn as it's been stolen. But there was another spanner thrown into the works. It was Chinese New Year and the RCBC bank was closed. Uh oh. Yeah. The bank manager at the Bangladesh Bank didn't notify the government. Instead, he contacted an acquaintance who was skilled in security and asked him to come and have a look. The manager thought there was some mistake and that the money had been sent to the wrong account and hoped that it would be returned. The security team looked at the CCTV at the bank as they thought it could have been someone from the inside. After looking at eight hours of security footage of the Swift room, which can only be accessed with a key, they realised that it wasn't an inside job because no one was at the computer. It took them a long time to realise that they had actually been victims of cybercrime. When they looked at the CCTV, the only person that they saw go into that room was the cleaner. Yeah, and they probably thought he definitely doesn't... I mean, he could have been. Yeah, he could have been behind but, the whole thing, but he doesn't actually touch yeah. the terminal or... No, that's true. But could you imagine just looking looking through eight hours and then <laughs> realising, oh, shit. Yeah. But then that's like eight hours wasted that you could have done something Yeah, exactly. Else, like. That's eight hours the hackers have got on their side. Yeah. So then on Tuesday, the 9th of February, the Lunar New Year had finished and the staff at the RCBC Bank returned to work. The Bangladesh Bank were still trying to stop any further withdrawals from the bank's accounts in the Philippines. There was still $59 million that they were trying to save. The RCBC received these messages, along with hundreds more. So the messages from Bangladesh went to the bottom of a big pile and they were never seen. Kim Wong got in touch with the manager at RCBC and asked for her to authorise the transfer of $59 million, which she did. All the while, the Bangladesh Bank was trying to stop the transactions, but the money had already gone. In late February 2016, the bank manager of the Bangladesh Bank didn't want anyone to know what happened. But in order to get the money back from the Philippines, he was requested to get a court order, but these are known to the public. A journalist spotted the court order and realised what had happened and published an article. As a result, the Bangladesh Bank Governor, Achur Rahman, resigned. Poor guy. Yeah. I mean, it was quite badly handled. Uh, Yeah, it was. But I think he was just like trying to, like, not make a big deal out of it. Like he, he probably thought, ah, oh, it's just a mistake. Yeah, he probably there. There might have been an element of denial. Like this can't actually be happening. It can be fixed. Yeah, and it's like, no, it can't be fixed. So why did the hackers choose Bangladesh Bank? Well, the intended target was the New York Fed. The New York Fed holds trillions of dollars in accounts globally, with one of the most top-notch computer security systems. It makes it one of the most difficult to hack. The hackers realised they couldn't get into the Fed's network system because of its high security, but it did have to communicate with other banks around the world, and this was the crucial flaw. 
so the hackers focused on the bank's communication systems. On a daily basis, thousands of transactions are made by the Fed on behalf of the central banks that hold US dollar reserves at the Fed. The Fed and other banks relied on SWIFT to send money around the world to other member banks. There only needed to be a single weak spot in the whole network to bring it down. So the hackers looked for another bank which communicated with it and which held a shit ton of reserves in New York. As the Bangladesh bank was in a distant land, compared to the Fed in New York, it was likely that the security would not be as high in its computer network. And boy, they were right. So how did the hackers cover their tracks? Firstly, the hackers deleted all of the history of the transactions they requested, but there were hard copies made of every transaction, which is why they sabotaged the printer. But if we go back to 2010 to find out how they hid their cyber fingerprints, we have to go back to a worm called Stuxnet, which impacted Iran's uranium enrichment site and interrupted the country's nuclear program by damaging one-fifth of the facility's centrifuges. The hackers got into the computers that controlled the centrifuges and made them explode. This malware was 40 times larger than any other encountered before, It was this big to be able to leave no trace. So the hackers were recording the network traffic of the computers controlling the centrifuges and then they played that back to the sensors when they started to change the operation of the centrifuges they were trying to destroy. So it looked like everything was acting normal if a staff member came back to check on it. Kind of like when you watch those bank heist films where the IT expert rigs the CCTV to like replay the clip and show that everything's happening normally. Yeah, it's like money heist. (laughs) Yeah. So this is what happened in the Bangladesh bank. The hackers discovered how they would be tracked and used it to cover their tracks. So what happened to the money? Once the money arrived in the Philippines, they had to launder it into hard cash, and they decided to take the money to the casinos in the Philippines where there were no money laundering laws to oversee large sums of money. Therefore, there were no records to say who came in with what money. The bank manager from the RCBC, Maya Deguito, who had opened the four accounts, withdrew the money, which then got passed to a remittance company called Philrem. Philrem was run by Salud and Michael Bautista. They were, along with Kim Wong, the owners of the casino called Soler, according to the hacked documentary. $22 million of the money was transferred to Philippine pesos, which was 1 million banknotes. Because of the amount of cash, Philrem had to ask a sister location for it, which arrived in boxes at the RCBC. A bank employee saw the manager of the bank load these boxes into a car, which was then driven away. The money was taken to Soler Casino, and the casino is situated right near the airport, So it was very easy for Chinese gamblers to come off the plane and head straight to the casino. The hackers enlisted their own crew of gamblers, mostly Chinese nationals, to launder the money. The money was changed for casino chips. Then a few games were played, then the chips were cashed in so the money received back was laundered and untraceable. As it was Lunar Week in China, it would have been usual to see Chinese high rollers come into the bank with that amount of cash. Hundreds of VIPs were gambling chips to launder this money, so the house had a 1% or 2% margin, but the rest is untraceable money. These individuals weren't concerned with winning, just playing. The money lost didn't go to the casino, but the other players on the table. So there would be a table of these players losing to each other on purpose, making it seem like someone was winning. They played for a whole week to launder the $22 million. That's a lot of gambling. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I've never been into a casino before, I don't think. Trying to think. I've been to a casino restaurant in London, the Hippodrome. Oh, yeah. Is it the Hippodrome? Yeah. But that's it. I don't think I've ever been in a casino. No. Don't think I'd want to be in a casino. No. I think it'd think be dangerous for me. I'm really good at cards. (laughs) It's just a very dangerous place, isn't it? I mean, not dangerous, but I don't know. 
Like if I went to Las Vegas, I would not want to go to a casino. I don't think I want to go to Las Vegas full stop. Yeah, that's true. I'd like to see the surrounding areas, like the Grand Canyon and whatnot. I've seen that as, yeah, I can thoroughly yeah, recommend Without that. having to go to Las, Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> trying to remember if I have. I don't think I have. No. I've played poker, like, a few times at home. Yeah. Yeah, I learned to play poker and then I just went completely out of my head. Yeah. And I don't, I don't have a good poker face. Yeah, I'm not sure if I do or not. Well, we won't be finding out in a casino, that's for sure. <laughs> So who were the people behind the heist? Well, every cyber attack has a signature. This could be the way the hackers state something or the way in which they code, for example. Experts were able to map a signature the hackers left behind at the Bangladesh bank and they traced it back to another attack that happened at Sony Pictures. On November 24th, 2014, people started the workday as normal but they were unable to get into the offices at Sony Pictures because the keycard system wasn't working. Eventually, they managed to enter the building and discovered that the computers and printers were not working. Laptops that were connected to the network had skulls and crossbones sharp on their screens, with scary Halloween music playing and a message saying, Hacked by the GOP, Guardians of the Peace, also known as the Lazarus Group. The hack at Sony leaked personal information of employees and email exchanges of A-list celebs. They stole a number of documents and emails. The malware from the Sony attack and the Bangladesh Bank attack used a component called an indexing manager, which saved the logs during the Swift attack and turned it into an encrypted file. The key they had used to encrypt the file was the same key used in the Sony Pictures attack. Experts found this out by Googling the key. Google. Gotta love it sometimes. Yeah, you can find everything out on Google. Almost. So who are the Lazarus Group? The Lazarus Group are an organisation of an unknown number of individuals run by the North Korean government. The Lazarus Group has been responsible for a number of attacks over the years bringing down websites in South Korea, the White House and the Pentagon. This organisation really started when sanctions were introduced in North Korea because they had to think of new ways to get cash. The hackers in the group are young individuals, as young as 12, who have been recruited straight from school and each has their own specialities. They are sent to the North Korean capital and intensely trained to become cyber warriors. For most countries... Cyber offensive campaigns are conducted by the military, and this is how the Lazarus Group is organised. According to the Billion Dollar Heist documentary, there are hotels in China where the group have set up taking over floors with dormitories where they eat and sleep. And hack. And hack, yeah. Eat, eat sleep, sleep, hack, hack repeat. <laughs> Could you imagine being a 12 year old? That's crazy, and just being recruited. Could you imagine being a 12-year-old in North Korea? Yeah, I can't. Uh. No, I can't. (laughs) But then, like, that's your life sentence. Yeah. To being a hacker. It's either that or complete poverty, I imagine. Yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. So, did anyone get caught for the Bangladesh attack? The Bangladesh police had to sift through 10 terabytes of data and they investigated if anyone inside the Bangladesh bank was responsible. The bank denied negligence and believed that the staff members were not responsible for the attack. As the attack was targeting the New York Fed, the FBI became involved and started their own investigations along with Interpol. There was a blame game where the Bangladesh Bank said that New York Fed should have done more to cancel the transactions and they should have acted sooner. And the New York Fed blamed Bangladesh Bank and SWIFT for their poor cyber security protocols. I think both parties are right because there's fault at both ends. Yeah. If Bangladesh hadn't had like cheap security systems, firstly it wouldn't have happened. And then who was the person that didn't reject the transactions because it was a huge amount of money but instead it was because the form was filled out correctly yeah (laughs) and like with swift 
you know, you've got thousands of institutions relying on your system to communicate with each other. How can you not be involved in setting up a proper security on the bank's end? Like, surely there should be someone there to make sure that everything's secure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but then I I think at the end of the day, it is still human error. And how can you not have a 24-7 hotline? Yeah, it's 2016, for God's sake. Yeah. It's not like internet banking is a, a new thing. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that hacks hacks had happened before, it's a bit silly. I guess in, in some cases you just feel a bit untouchable. Like if you're the New York Fed, it's like, oh yeah, we've got great security. Yeah. No one's going to touch us. Yeah, yeah. But you're holding the reserves for other banks. Yeah, they obviously didn't think about their other bank friends. No. <laughs> Later on in 2016, the Philippines launched a Senate inquiry into the laundering of the stolen funds. The RCBC bank manager, Mayor Deguito, told the court that she opened the accounts for Kim Wong, the casino owner, who she had known for years. Mayor had met four other people whose names were on the accounts. Her lawyer, Ferdinand Tapaccio, who legitimately has a painting of Hitler on his office wall. I missed that. You can see it in the um, Hacks documentary. And it's a massive, massive painting of Hitler. Okay. It's really disturbing. Yeah, a bit questionable. Yeah. Anyway, her lawyer said that Mr Wong presented Mayer documents and vouched for the identities of the other account holders and requested that the accounts be opened in her branch with the promise that a huge amount would be transferred to these accounts. Maya said that she was naive and a pawn in a plan that she clearly didn't understand at the time. Kim Wong has not been charged but is subject to civil action. He refuted Maya's telling of what happened and that the money was stolen. He said, I have nothing to do with any bank documents to get money in the country. I do not know the source of the $81 million. Mayer claimed five bank accounts. I just referred a foreigner to Mayer. Okay. Hmm. ICBC Bank was fined nearly $20 million for failing to comply with banking regulations and the chief executive and president resigned. ICBC's lawyer, Tia Deep, said that Mayer de Gita was a rogue employee and disagreed that Mayer didn't realise what she was doing as she was trained in all of the policies ICBC Bank holds. The lawyer also said that Mayer knew about the accounts and set them up. She waited for the funds to be credited and when they were, she acted quickly to get the money out of the beneficiaries' accounts and into other accounts. The inquiry documented the timing of the payments, many made within minutes of each other. Mayer's lawyers said that when funds were received on February 5th, She confirmed the legitimacy of the remittances with RCBC head office and received notification that they were from valid sources. Mayer didn't have authority to prevent transfers and she was told that there was no reason to hold the funds. The Anti-Money Laundering Council in the Philippines launched an investigation. The Philippine Department of Justice recommended that Mayer de Guito should be charged with eight counts of money laundering which she pled not guilty. One of Maya's former colleagues, Romualdo Agarado, said that at the time of the heist, Maya was being threatened. He told the inquiry, she said a lot of things, but what stuck in my mind was her saying, I would rather do this than me being killed or my family. However, Maya's lawyer denied that there was a threat at all. Her lawyer said that she had been offered a deal to speak to the FBI which had been leading the international investigation. The FBI, according to Mayer's lawyer, offered limited immunity. The conclusion was that it would not offer enough protection, so the offer was declined. The only case the Justice Department pursued was Mayor de Guito's, despite the Anti-Money Laundering Council's request that the complaint against Kim Wong and the owners of Philrem be reconsidered. However, the Senate inquiry had a difficult time with working around the strict privacy of bank accounts. The Philippines, Switzerland and Lebanon have one of the most secretive banking sectors in the world. Therefore, they could not get access to Wong's bank account because of the Bank Secrecy Act. 
About $15 million had been recovered, according to the Philippine Senate report, some of which was handed over by Wong, who denied knowledge that it was stolen. So why did he hand it over if he... Yeah. The Anti-Money Laundering Council sued Phil Rem for the return of $17 million of the stolen funds. Phil Rem denied it had the money. In 2017, the Department of Justice cleared Phil Rem of any money laundering complaints, but then in 2019 renewed the charges of four counts of money laundering against Phil Rem's owners. Also in 2019, the Bangladesh Bank filed charges against the RCBC in New York, which were squashed in 2020 by the New York court, which led to RCBC suing the Bangladesh Bank for defamation. So the only person charged for the supposed role in the heist was the RCBC bank manager, Mayor Degito. She was found guilty of eight counts of money laundering in 2019. She received a sentence of 56 years and fined $109 million. Typical that a crime orchestrated by men sees a woman charged for it, and she probably wasn't that guilty in the first place. Yeah, she would have been like one of the least important people involved in this crime. Yeah, I felt sorry for her. Yeah, I felt sorry for her. The Senate inquiry made the recommendations that casinos should be included in the money laundering laws and that accessing bank details be made easier. No shit, really? Yeah. New laws were passed in July 2017 and a new central bank governor was put in place to make it harder for illegal money to enter the system. But there was no change to the strict banking privacy law. What about the Lazarus Group then? In January 2017, it was thought that the Lazarus Group was successful in attacking cryptocurrency exchanges. At least five exchanges in Asia, a total of $571 million, was lost. In May 2017, the Lazarus Group launched a ransomware called WannaCry, which I mentioned earlier. It targeted Windows computers, encrypted data and asked for a ransom for the return of that data. It affected industry, communications, governance and healthcare in 150 countries. Even if people paid the ransom, they didn't get their data back as the hackers didn't have the decryption key. Turns out the Lazarus Group repurposed a tool called Eternal Blue, which was developed by the National Security Agency in the US. This tool was leaked by the Russian government. I think this one is one of the sadder cases because organisations like the NHS were amongst the victims and that impacted patient care. So like because the IT systems were down, patients were being turned away or they were being diverted to hospitals that weren't impacted and some patients that needed procedures, they had to have those procedures cancelled or because staff couldn't access patient notes and documents and... You know, the NHS is a mess as it is. Yeah, yeah. imagine if it happened during the pandemic or if it happened now. Oh my you God, yeah. I mean, it wasn't great back then. It's like worse now. So I think that's one of the sadder consequences of these sort of hacks when it actually does lead to the risk of people's lives. Yeah, definitely. In 2020, the company AstraZeneca, who was behind one of the the COVID-19 vaccine, it was attacked where sensitive information was stolen and sold on for profit. The US has labelled the Lazarus Group as an advanced persistent threat. Very little is known who exactly is in the Lazarus Group, but the FBI have suspicions about one person called Park Jin Huik, also known as Pak Jin Hek and Park Kwang Jin. According to the FBI, Park is a computer programmer who works for the North Korean company Choson Expo, based in the Chinese city of Dalian. According to Park's cyber footprint, he was in Dalian between 2002 and 2013-2014. He then appeared to be in Pyongyang, North Korea. The US authorities charged Park with conspiracy to commit computer fraud and abuse and wire fraud. He could get 20 years if he is caught. So, yeah, that was uh, an interesting one. Yeah, a bit different to what we're used to (laughs) learning about and talking about. But also, I mean, it is quite sad because Bangladesh, it is one, it's the 170th poorest country in the world. So the amount of money that they lost is huge for that country. And 
it can have like serious repercussions on a whole population where people survive on less than two dollars a day. And as well as the economic effect, there would have also been reputational damage for the country, especially the banking system. Yeah, yeah. And like security in general, like computer security. Yeah, yeah. And I I feel for the bank employees as well. Yeah, I do as well. Because they must have felt at fault. Yeah. And very, very helpless. Yeah. But it just goes to show you, don't click on any links. Yeah. (laughs) Unless you go through your IT department first. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, it can happen so easily. Yeah. And this poor woman, Maya Degoto, she got the full brunt of it. And I mean, she only participated in part of the heist. And we don't know if she was like all knowing or if she was just gullible and, and believed this Kim Wong. I reckon she was threatened because that's a good way to get someone to comply. And the, the, these, this group of men, they are, they're obviously very powerful if they've got access to all this money and they've got access to hackers. So I think it's quite believable that she was threatened to just do what they said and transfer the money. That's my my belief anyway. No, I can believe that as well. But I can also believe that Kim Wong, who opened the accounts, who wanted the accounts mm. opened, I can imagine he's quite a um, charming person when he wants to be and can make people believe what he's telling them is the truth. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, he's got other bank accounts open, assuming because he's a casino owner. Yeah. He's, he's going to know how to work that system, surely. Yeah. I can't remember which documentary they mention it in, but it's quite frustrating because one of the guys that was talking, he was saying that he was asking for tighter money laundering laws when they were building these casinos. Because there's, I think there was like three huge casinos being built. And he was like, if you're going to build these casinos, you need tighter laws. And no one listened to him. Yeah. (laughs) They all dismissed him, didn't they? Yeah. 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 Idiots. Yeah. I mean, the question is, do we have an over-dependency on the internet and our devices and, you know, network technologies? Are we relying too much on on these things? Yes, we definitely do. I mean, it's te- technology is a blessing and a curse. When it works, it's amazing. But, you know, you don't even need hackers. Like, you can just have a glitch or the network going down. Yeah. I remember when I was doing my GCSEs, this mm. is like back in the day. Yonks ago. I was doing my business studies coursework and I think back then we were using floppy disks and I can remember that if you if you kept ejecting and inserting the disk a number of times like yeah. it would corrupt itself yeah and that's what happened to my coursework on oh, the no. floppy disk and I didn't make another backup that's another mistake people make they don't back things yeah. up yeah I learned from that mistake yeah but yeah, it's amazing how viruses travel through networks like that when technology first started, like with the floppy disks. Yeah, yeah. And now it's just like instant. Exactly. I mean, it's done remotely. These people were in, like everything happened in different locations. No one had to step into the country like Bangladesh or New York physically. They all did it remotely. It's quite scary. And our everyday lives can be disrupted by these things. And Yeah. I think it was in Billion Dollar Heist. They said that like there's climate change is a threat to human life, weapons of mass destruction and cybercrime. Yeah. I, I can see, yeah. I can believe that. Yeah. Because that's, that's our communication now. Yeah, it's how, it's how we're communicating right now. Yeah, exactly. But every security system, every healthcare system, police, military. Yeah. If the, in- if the internet went down, nothing would work. But it's quite scary that there's like an army being created in North Korea. Like what else are they, what can they be capable of in the future? Yeah. And everyone's worried about like World War Three with like bombs. As- you know, when the whole Ukraine thing was happening is, oh God, World War Three, whatever. It's like, yeah, World War Three is either going to be nuclear or cyber. I think it's more likely to be cyber than nuclear. Mm. And someone said that in one of the documentaries. Not that specifically, but they said that it's going to get worse. Yeah. But uh, this was an interesting case. I enjoyed researching this. Yeah, it was definitely different and interesting. And 
I feel sorry for Bangladesh. Yeah, I do as well. But I mean, your your family's from Bangladesh. You've been to Bangladesh. Yeah, exactly. I've been to Dhaka, yeah. Absolutely stinks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went, I went, it's been almost 20 years. But this is the other thing, you know, so when I went to Bangladesh as a like really young child, at least in the villages, there was no electricity. Mm. So no lighting, no, there was no TVs, no telephones. We had like oil lanterns and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden when I went in early 2000s, um, so about a decade before this heist, then there was electricity in the villages at least. I don't know what the cities were like, but they had like computers. And so at the same time, you've got a country that's like, unlike uh, more developed countries where the technology has kind of evolved and developed, countries like Bangladesh, they kind of had this influx. So they wouldn't have been as up to speed with technology and security yeah, because they, they wouldn't have had any mistakes to learn from like other developed nations have. Yeah, yeah. And obviously there's also the cost issue as well. Like they're going to choose the cheaper option because they probably don't have that much money. Like they, they're not a very wealthy country. So um, yeah, but um, yeah, no, that was an interesting case. Definitely a lot more different to what I usually read about when I read about crime. Yeah, same here. And I think next week's one is also going to be a slightly different one. Yeah, it's an unusual one. But we're going to be talking about fair dodging or fair evading. Don't knock it till you've listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, people don't pay the the money to get tickets on transport. Yeah, and there's been some extreme circumstances. Yeah, <laughs> people have gone to prison for this. It's, it's a criminal offence in some countries. And there's been riots. Yeah. And people forging tickets for all sorts of reasons. And quite quite wealthy people who have been fair evading as well. Yes. Yeah, it's all very interesting, folks. We promise. <laughs> <laughs> so join us next week for that. Yes. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Yeah, and please like us and subscribe to us and download us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening to the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find more information about the show on our website at feloniouspod.com or on our Instagram at feloniouspod. Links to our show notes can be found in the episode description as well as through our website and social media. You can visit our Contact Us page and tell us what you think about the show and if there are any cases you would like us to cover. We hope you join us for the next episode. Goodbye. Bye.